This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. In this lecture, we're going to work through Chapter 2 of the SEMA P2 lecture notes. And Chapter 2 is mod headed mon Modern Manufacturing Environment. And in fact, everything in this chapter you should have studied before. So it should be very much revision. Uh, but first of all, just a few minutes on that second section, Modern Manufacturing. I'm probably an awful lot older than those of you watching this. But life for businesses used to be so much easier when I was young. Because if we were a company making desks, we'd probably be the only company in the area making desks. We hadn't got anything like the same level of competition as there is now. And it was very much, we built the desks. I was going to say we can charge what we like. I mean, that is obviously ridiculous. But we could, you know, build our desks properly, decide on the cost, add on a profit, and you know, we could sell them at that price. These days, of course, the world has changed enormously. And you've got that long list there which I'm not going to talk through each one, we'd be there forever. But all these aspects that have changed in the modern world, the level of competition, obviously, these days is enormous. My example of the desk manufacturer just doesn't exist anymore. There are desk manufacturers all over the place are tied in further down with globalisation and distribution networks, they all very much go together. So, you know, at one time, if you wanted a desk, you could only really go to the local manufacturer. These days, you can buy it from almost anywhere because of globalization, because of technology, the internet. You can order it from anywhere, and because of the efficient distribution networks now, you can get it delivered rapidly. It's no longer just me serving my area. Consumers have much more power. Product life cycle, we discuss elsewhere, but is um, so much more rapid. New products keep emerging. Product diversity, advanced production methods. You know, things used to always be made by hand. Now, the impact of technology, robotics, the way we make things has changed. Qualities become much more uh, a feature. Environmental concerns didn't used to worry anybody particularly. Now it's become fairly vital. I mentioned before, um, when I mentioned technology, the impact of the World Wide Web, that you can order products from virtually anywhere. Much more legislation and regulation. Uh, participation of employees no longer purely they're told what to do and they do it, you know, much more participation and new measures of performance. So all sorts of ways in which manufacturing has changed and because of that, the, the accounting, the management accounting, the costing that goes with it, the pricing policies that go with it, they've all had to change as well. Uh, over the page, there's mention of just in time, which again is something you should have covered before. Uh, but let me talk for a few minutes because too many people think of just in time as, oh, having minimum inventory levels. And it does involve having minimum inventory levels, but there's much more to it. It's much more of a philosophy. And just for a few minutes, let me go away from that, that page. Just ask yourself, or I ask myself, why conventionally do businesses keep inventory? Do they keep stock? Traditionally, they have an inventory of raw materials. Why? Oh, it's for things like, uh, suppose there's a late delivery from a supplier. If our, if our supplier is late delivering raw materials, 
If we've none in inventory, then production stops. I appreciate, I'm writing down here reasons why, traditionally, companies do keep inventories, okay? But, you know, again, if a supplier's late delivering, fine, as long as we've got inventory, we can carry on. If we don't have any inventory, we've got a problem. Uh, another reason? Uh, our workers might damage the materials. We make cars, we've... Um, we need uh, the head headlamps, the, the lights. Drop one. And as long as we've got inventory, no problem. We get another one, fit that one. But if we've no inventory and a worker drops one and breaks it, production stops. So, um, damage by employees. Or oh, similar idea. Uh, if our suppliers delivered some faulty material, fine. If it's faulty, and so long as we've got inventory, we can go and get some new uh, material and continue. If we've no inventory and we get some faulty material, everything stops. So faulty material. Now, I'm not going to go on and on there, but there are examples of why Traditionally, we might keep inventories of raw materials. Uh, what else? Uh, work in progress. You know, our part finished uh, goods in the factory. Uh, well, this is very much a fact of life, surely. Uh, if it takes me uh, a month to produce our product, then inevitably there's lots of work in progress. Um, this, as I say, is a fact of life. It's due to the time taken. Uh, to produce. And finally, what about finished goods? Why again, traditionally, I'll become a desk maker again. Why traditionally, would you expect me to keep an inventory of desks? Obvious. So that we can supply a customer. If a customer comes in today and wants a hundred, if it provided we've got inventory, we can supply. If we don't have any, well, the danger is he goes elsewhere and we lose the business. So it's to be able to supply the customers. A lot of that may be obvious, but if we go through them one by one, why? Raw materials, we keep inventory because the supplier might deliver late and we've got a problem. Oh, surely we need to have arrangements with our suppliers that they don't deliver late, that they always deliver on time. And if they don't, then maybe there should be a penalty or we change suppliers. But if the supplier delivers on time, well, we no longer need to carry inventory to cover that problem. Damage by workers. Well, our, our workers shouldn't be damaging the material. It cost, that costs us money anyway. If they keep breaking things, it's costing us. We should make sure our workers work better. Because if they're not damaging, we're saving money because of it, and also there's less need to carry inventory. Faulty material. Well, again, it's back to our suppliers. We should ensure that our suppliers are delivering perfect material. And if they don't, again, there are penalties or we change suppliers. It should be in the contract. And if we're not receiving faulty material, again, there's one less reason to keep inventory of raw materials. But not only by having less inventory have we less storage costs, but at the same time, cutting out damage by workers, cutting out faulty material, it's saving us money anyway. Uh, what about work in progress? I said that is inevitable. It takes you a month uh, to produce. Clearly, throughout the month, there are part finished items. But why is it taking us a month? Surely, 
the faster we can produce, the better. Because not only does that save us money, obviously if workers produce faster, it's cutting costs. But if they're producing faster, then we've got less work in progress. Now I'm not saying you could reduce that to zero. It obviously depends what you're producing. If you make cars, there's a limit clearly to how fast we can make them. And therefore there will be some work in progress. But the faster we produce, we're saving money on it anyway, and uh, uh, we're carrying less inventory. And finally, finished goods. Oh, so we can always supply customers. Fine. <coughs> if we can't supply, if we've no inventory, there is that risk the customer goes elsewhere. But if we can produce quickly and we tell the customer, all right, you want 100 desks, they'll be ready tomorrow. Then the customer's unlikely to go elsewhere. We won't lose the sale. And of course, I've already said, producing faster is beneficial anyway. It cuts our labour costs. The faster we can produce, the less inventory we need to keep. Because the, the, the customer would normally wait a reasonable time. And of course... By cutting finished, uh, the, the inventory of finished goods, not only are we um, saving on storage costs, but also um, saving on the risk of goods becoming obsolete or, or never selling them. What's the, uh, what's the point in producing and carrying lots of inventory and then fighting to try and sell them when we may not sell them? An extreme example, look at McDonald's. They keep virtually no inventory of burgers. There may be one or two on the shelf, but they make it to order because they can produce so fast you don't mind waiting a few minutes for it to be produced. Look at Dell computers. I know some are sold through shops, but uh, certainly initially uh, they used to sell through the internet and they kept no inventory at all of finished computers. You'd order it on the internet, specify what you wanted, then they'd make it. And because they could make it so fast, uh, you were prepared to wait. So produce fast, no need for inventory finished goods. Now to say no inventory uh, is extreme, but by going for those things, working faster, working better, less damage, etc. All of them are saving us money and they give rise to less need for inventory. The lower the inventory can be, the better. And if you look back at the list on um, that, in the notes, can you recall the features of Just In Time and its relationship in terms of the following, sorry, I'm trying to get the scroll working, it doesn't seem to want to. Um, but the levels of inventory holding, I've already mentioned, keep as low as possible. Maintenance of machinery. We need to make sure the machinery is maintained, because if the machinery stops working, it breaks down, then it holds up production. It were inefficient. Empowerment of workers. Uh, let them be involved, they're more likely to work efficiently, then them suggest how we can work better. Pull production flow. That's this McDonald's idea that instead of producing and then trying to sell, let demand dictate production. A customer comes in and wants 100, fine, we produce 100. Another customer comes in and wants 50, we produce 50. We produce to meet demand. Uh, quality, quality in terms of the supplies we get from our uh, materials like we get from our suppliers. Quality in terms of um, how well our workers are working. Quality in the sense of what we deliver to customers. Because again, if they get poor quality and they need it replacing, well, if we haven't got inventory, they're going to have to wait. The customer gets even more upset. And wastefulness. 
again, an extreme was my dropping the lights and breaking them. We don't want material wasted. It's costing us money. And if we're going to waste material, it means we need to keep extra inventory. Uh, no doubt some of the benefits and problems. Well, I'm not going to say a lot here that, uh, that I haven't already said. You know, the benefits, well, I hope I've made that clear. Faster working saves money. Less damage saves money. Lower inventory. Uh, less holding costs. Less storage costs. Less chance of obsolescence. The drawbacks. Things like, it, it, however much we try, the supplier does let us down with a problem. Um, however much we try, if our workers do break things and waste, we have a problem. But it needs very careful monitoring and everybody working well. Now, there's things between just in time production and just in time purchasing. Uh, again, I didn't use those words, but I've effectively dealt with it. Uh, just in time purchasing. is where the supplier is delivering as virtually as soon as we want it. You know, we order, they supply. Uh, the faster they supply, and the fact they supply on time, is less need for inventory. Make the supplier carry the inventory, they can deliver immediately. Uh, Just-in-time production is this idea of working faster and producing to meet demand rather than producing just to create inventory and then trying to sell them. Uh, over the page, supply chain management, very much saying the same thing. Managing our suppliers, having an alliance with our suppliers. We do need better inventory control. Supermarkets most big supermarkets carry very little inventory in the actual store. They obviously have on the shelves, but I mean, they carry very little at the back. And it's because they're managing the whole thing very well. In that when you go through checkout, um, the scanning, the computer's keeping checks on how much is being sold and knows if we're starting to run out of something. And so if they suddenly find today, oh, we're selling a lot more washing powder than normal, it, the computer will immediately place an order to the central depot. Uh, and supermarkets get deliveries several times a day. And it, it's always up to date. You know, if something, if something isn't selling today, they don't get any more today. If something's selling fast, fine, they get more deliveries today. And it's only the central depot who holds the inventory, rather than having it at every individual store. Um, that ties in with customer order process. That oh, I'm not a supermarket, but in a similar sort of way, we need to make sure that we're dealing with orders efficiently, quickly. Order today, produce tomorrow, deliver the next day. The logistics. Uh, next page uh, is about quality. Again, something you should already be familiar with. But the important bit being paragraph six and seven. There's a big focus these days on quality. And I'm going to start at the bottom here because the thing that, the aspect of quality that most people think of uh, initially is that, of course, we want to deliver quality goods to the customer. And why? Because if we're not delivering quality to the customers, it's going to cost us money. And so <coughs> these headings, I'll say I'm starting at the bottom. Non-conformance costs are the costs of poor quality. Why does poor quality cost us money? And external failure costs, these are perhaps the most obvious ones. They're the costs involved when there's poor quality delivered to the customer. And in fact, 
You can see that's already typed there, so I'm being a bit redundant. Uh, but why does it cost money if we give a uh, poor call to the customer? You've got there the cost of return items, having to replace, having to repair, and although difficult to quantify, loss of goodwill. But of course, if uh, we deliver bad quality today, we might lose that customer for good. Uh, the lost future sales. So those are costs of external failure, but also there are costs of internal failure. And these are uh, uh, costs of poor quality that don't affect the customer, but things like wastage or damage of materials by our workers. It's bad quality working, it's costing us money. Or, um, we've made a product, we realise that it's no good before it goes to the customer, but it has to be reworked or it has to be thrown away. Customer isn't affected because we spotted it before it went to them, but it is costing us money. So uh, failures incurred by the firm before it reaches the customer, costs of reworking, scrapping items, as I just said. So those are the two types of costs involved if we do have bad quality. But in, how are we going to get better quality? Well, there are costs involved of improving quality. Conformance costs. Costs of improving quality. And I'm still working up at the bottom because external failure costs deliver back quality to the customer. The obvious way of uh, avoiding that cost or certainly reducing it um, is quality control. That the more quality control checks we have, certainly before it's delivered to the customer, but all the way through production, the more checks we have, the more we can spot bad quality. Uh, and cut the cost. Well, that's called appraisal costs. Because, of course, all right, have quality control, customer gets good quality, but it's costing us money to do the quality control, to do the appraisal. And finally, the ideal, of course, would be not to have poor quality in the first place, you know, for our workers not to be wasting material, for our workers to be working quickly and efficiently, not needing to do rework and things. In a perfect world, we wouldn't need appraisal costs because everything could be done right first time. Well, there are costs of achieving that, you know, costs of training the employees, for example, to do things better. Uh, we call them prevention costs. So, be clear about the terminology, conformance, non-conformance. Now, one little thing, you wouldn't be asked to draw this graph, but just as an, I don't seem to be able to move forward, so I'd like to be very tiny, it's a sort of little illustrative graph. Um, if I did a graph of the costs against the level of quality, here's poor quality, here's good quality, Oh, now I can move it. Uh, it's only illustrative, this. But, as far as costs of non-conformance are concerned, obviously, the better the quality, the lower the cost. These are costs of non-conformance. On the other hand, the costs of getting better quality, the cost of conformance, the better the quality, the more it's going to cost you. So you've got here costs of conformance. Uh, now, there has to be a trade off. You know, we can never achieve perfect quality because it's too expensive. You know, if you add the two together at each level, the idea would be to minimise the total costs involved, you know, to get a reasonable level of quality, 
at a cost efficient in a cost efficient way. Okay, just one more page, and then we'll have a, a, a break. Uh, over the page, total quality management is this focusing on quality all the way through. You're focusing on the customer, what the customer needs. Designing products from the customer's point of view. Get it right first time. I said earlier, it been uh, and the ideal would be that we didn't have any appraisal costs because we were preventing poor quality. Continuous improvement, always looking and involving the employees, always looking at ways of improving the quality of what we do. Employee participation is important. Um, it's then we need to be working better. We need them to take pride in the work. We need them to be involved. And so finally, for the moment, quality circles. Get employees involved, uh, discussing, looking for ways of improving what we're doing. Uh, in particular, improving the quality. I will right, we'll have a break there and then carry on with the rest of the chapter in the next lecture.